Thank you very much, Rory, for the kind uh, introduction. Um, so I'm going to have three acts to this particular talk. Um, the first will be to warm me up probably more than anyone else, um, then to uh, talk about some of the research achievements um, uh, uh, thus far around the space of wearables, trying to transform our understanding of how physical activity is associated uh, with uh, major disease outcomes. Uh, then uh, once I am warmed up, uh, I'll share with you my own I guess, personal journey then, because um, uh, this talk is as much for family as it is uh, for scientists as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll end up by uh, going back to science and discussing some of the uh, what I think are wonderful opportunities that wearables, machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, offer us to transform and enhance how we conduct epidemiological studies uh, in the 21st century. And I'm going to be skipping backwards and forwards through time a little bit. And my first uh, uh, skip backwards is to about 15 years ago, uh, whereby uh, the, the, these were two seminal studies that took place uh, in the US uh, and in England. So the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey and the Health Survey for England. And uh, essentially, these two surveys uh, and a large amount of people were trying to assess uh, how active is the US nation or uh, how active is uh, the English nation? And they tried two ways of trying to assess that. The first was by asking people via self-report. And the second then uh, was uh, via uh, directly measuring it via devices, um, usually kind of type of device you put on your wrist uh, and would measure how much or on your hip and measure how much you move around. And as you can see, you get very, very different answers uh, when you ask people what they do versus directly measuring what they do. And for the physical activity epidemiology community, uh, this was uh, really a moment of crisis and trying to think about, well, how good are our past measurements? Uh, can, how much can we trust the device based measurements? Um, uh, and really, then, how important is physical activity for health? What are the consequences of this? Um, but what we really needed back then and lacked back then and were large scale studies that uh, prospectively and longitudinally followed people up uh, over a substantial amount of time then to see what the uh, uh, the adverse consequences of device measured physical activity were. And within our department then, uh, as Rory has briefly mentioned, the UK Biobank study uh, really is uh, in so many ways a world leading study and within the world of physical activity epidemiology, it is the world's leading study whereby 100,000 people generously agreed to wear a device for seven days uh, on their wrist uh, and just go about their everyday activities. And by giving this kind of Fitbit type device to people, it helped us uh, get much more exquisite measurements of uh, how much people move, when they move. Um, uh, so, uh, for example, uh, the people were really compliant and wearing the devices. And we can see then X axis here is our hour of day. Y axis is this thing called mean acceleration. Higher values mean a person's a bit more active. And you can see, as expected, that older people are a lot less active than younger people, particularly in the afternoon, afternoons and early evening times. Um, so this gives us a chance, at least, then of measuring activity in people and a large number of people. And what's the key thing about this UK biobank study then was the longitudinal follow up knowing what happened to people after they wore the device. Uh, so I got a picture of Rama uh, Ramakrishnan and who's in uh, now in NPU and is sitting uh, there uh, in, in the middle uh, of the room. Uh, so Rama then worked with Terry Dwyer, Derek Bennett, myself and others, uh, whereby we did, I would say, the first uh, robust uh, investigation then of how a accelerometer measured physical activity is associated with disease outcomes. Um, and what we could see is very clearly that people who are doing more exercise um, had a lower risk uh, of developing uh, or an apparently lower risk of developing future cardiovascular disease. Now, you might say to me, well, I, why did you go to all that hassle to say more physical activity might be better for you with respect to your cardiovascular health? What was really surprising here was the uh, the the um, uh, how strong the association was. So Whoops. Um, so because in the past, when we're looking at outcomes such as mortality or cardiovascular disease, uh, we would normally expect people to do more exercise who were on this side of the, to the right hand side, uh, that their hazard ratio or uh, was about 0.8 or thereabouts. However, when we're using device measured activity, we can then see that uh, the 
the hazard ratio is more hovering around 0 0.5, 0 0.6, showing that uh, or suggesting that physical activity is probably uh, twice as important as we perhaps had previously thought uh, with respect to its strength of association of major disease outcomes. And so this is uh, incredibly exciting. And uh, in addition, then, by having these device based measurements, uh, we've been able to conduct uh, or develop machine learning methods uh, to try and essentially from a device make a really good guess uh, as to when a person is sitting or walking or driving or running uh, or climbing upstairs, etc. Uh, because the fundamental behind that is that from these, these devices measure movement 100 times a second so we can identify patterns or signatures that are associated with sitting that are different to the patterns or signatures associated with walking that are different to the patterns or signatures associated with driving. Uh, so back a few years ago, we had uh, Matthew Willits um, uh, and Sven Hollywell then did a lot of work in developing machine learning methods uh, to uh, uh, to automatically measure these attributes uh, from uh, the devices. And then that really opened the window then for uh, Rosemary Wamsley, uh, who was in our department until very recently, uh, who's um, developed a, a form of epidemiological health association method that's called compositional data analysis. And it allowed us then to try and see the trade off between different physical activity behaviours uh, and how they're associated uh, with uh, disease outcomes, and more or less finding that if you go from any type of behavior, this is moving, well, I'll talk you through this bit first. This is 70 behavior, light activity, trading one off of the other. Uh, so then as I do more light activity at the expense of sedentary activity, my uh, estimated hazard or my estimated risk of cardiovascular disease uh, goes down. Uh, but then as you see, if you move from any type of behavior into moderate to vigorous activity, uh, you uh, get a huge uh, um, or apparent uh, uh, favourable uh, association in terms of uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, risk profile. So it's been, I think, incredibly exciting. So I'm going to stop talking about science there now for a little bit, because um, for me, it's been a huge privilege to be part of the scientific journey. And what I often think in terms of the science is what's happened in the past is nowhere near as exciting as what can happen in the future. Uh, but I'll describe to you how I've got to this point uh, thus far in terms of my personal journey. Uh, and then I'll finish up uh, talking about what I think are some of the wonderful opportunities uh, to further enhance what we're doing to try and better understand uh, uh, the causes and consequences of disease. So the accent, um, as uh, I think many of you would know by now, is an Irish one. Uh, my wife, Kate, tries to claim it's not uh, as strong as it once was. Um, but uh, at least my parents are visiting them to recalibrate me then to get the accent a little bit stronger again, which is nice. Um, so this is a map of Ireland here on the left hand side. Um, we've got uh, coloured in pink then, uh, I guess it's currently two countries and we've got Northern Ireland here, uh, Republic of Ireland. And then I'm from this area, Donegal, which is up in the uh, top uh, left hand side as everyone looks at. Um, so sometimes it's called the forgotten county of Ireland. So it's uh, kind of almost cut off by the border um, uh, from Dublin where our government is. Um, but it's an incredibly stunning and beautiful place. Um, so we've, uh, as you can see, there's like hundreds of miles of coastline. Now, this is a view from actually quite near my own house then too. So it's uh, if anybody's thinking of somewhere to go for a nice uh, holiday uh, with somewhere, lots of nice scenery, here's a, a, an amazing place to go. And in fact, I saw Pete Scarborough walk into the room there too. Pete's in the back uh, of the room. So then uh, Pete, his uh, in-laws are from around here as well. And I'm from this little part, the very jutted headland uh, at the north. So. So think of the part of Ireland I'm from as the John O'Groats of, uh, of, of Ireland. So it's the most northerly point. Uh, and just to prove my home was near the sea, um, uh, we've got uh, the, the, the sea around here. It actually goes all the way around uh, us. So it's right out in the headland. So there's my own house. It was described locally usually as the little house beside the big shed. Um, so uh, where dad would have all these uh, tractors uh, there too. So. Um, so it was really idyllic uh, growing up uh, as a child and uh, near the beach like this, um, uh, maybe apart from the winter months when we would have 100 mile an hour winds uh, kind of blowing the head off us. Um, and one of my favourite places around um, is this uh, area here called Lag Beach. Um, so this is about just a few miles away from my house. Uh, it's got uh, it's got a beautiful big strand here, Trebegi Bay. And uh, the area of uh, Donegal I'm from, it's uh, Called any shown, and when I was growing up, I think one sixth of the population had a surname of Doherty. Um, so we're uh, we're all uh, very closely knit. Uh, so 
uh, my dad's family be from kind of over this direction. My mum's family are from Carondona up there. Um, th this church has got some significance for me. It's where I got married. Um, it's probably then, uh, I guess, probably uh, half my dad's family are buried there. Maybe that's where I might end up myself then too, but uh, at some point in the future. Um, so this is uh, was really idyllic uh, growing up around there. Um, and then this is a picture of uh, myself when I was younger with my family. So it's uh, my mum and dad then who are not looking a, a day older than they're sitting here in the middle of the room. Um, uh, and we've got my two sisters and uh, Maria and Denise. Uh, so Denise is now a, a nurse. Uh, Maria is a, um, a teacher um, and they both actually live within around two miles of my parents' home there still. So uh, unfortunately, I was the one that uh, that escaped uh, from uh, um, from there. Uh, so then uh, the reason as well, my hair is looking probably a bit better today than usual is my mum is a hairdresser there. So she made sure that I was looking a bit more spick and span uh, for the talk uh, today. Um, and then uh, dad was a, a school teacher um, uh, and has now discovered in his retirement a new career as a, a bus driver as well. So, um, uh, And one of my great ambitions uh, when I was growing up, uh, so it's very much a uh, um, an agricultural community growing up near here. So my my great ambition in life uh, was to be a farmer and I really wanted to uh, own some sheep. Um, so this is, I think, the closest uh, I then got um, uh, to, to, to that. Um, uh, so I um, uh, quickly realised that probably farming might not uh, suit my own skill set um, uh, particularly well, but uh, it was one of my uh, big dreams when I was growing up under the age of 10. Probably after the age of 10, then I wanted to become a footballer, um, uh, but it was quite a probably not a good career choice as a picture of me then with a captain in the local team at under 16 level. Um, and uh, but it probably wasn't a good career choice uh, since the sport I played was Irish Gaelic football. That's um, uh, it's uh, well, first of all, an amateur sport, so we would not uh, get paid uh, for it. Um, uh, and then secondly, it's kind of this strange mix of uh, soccer and rugby. You can imagine them mixed up together with the rules and you end up with something like Irish Gaelic football. Although it did come in handy for me years later. So my very strange claim to fame is that I have um, won four varsity matches against Cambridge, um, but they're in the obscure sports of Irish Gaelic football and Australian rules football. So um, uh, not the glamorous ones, uh, certainly. Um, but towards the end of my teens, then I began to realise that uh, what I was really quite passionate about then was computing and uh, and uh, uh, this uh, and uh, computer coding, etc. So my early career was in computer science. Um, my undergraduate was in uh, uh, Derry slash London Derry, then uh, in the University of Ulster, and uh, my uh, PhD was in Dublin City University, uh, and. A theme throughout my own career uh, pathway then is that of having uh, been really lucky uh, in many ways. And one of those ways uh, was uh, having some really good mentors. Um, so one of my mentors here is uh, Kevin Curran then, uh, who was my uh, 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 essentially mentor in the final year, my final year project in, in computer science. Because at that point, I quite blinkered views of just trying to learn how to code and do it well and get the computer programs to run efficiently. Uh, but Kevin really um, uh, engendered in me then the uh, a love of research and trying to do new things and not just simply copying what others are doing. Um, and I, I have to admit, even going into my final year of my undergraduate, I never even heard of a PhD. I, I kind of assumed a master's was as high as you would go um, and just simply didn't know about that. Um, so he was really good in opening my eyes to that there could be a world of research out there. And then uh, I met Alan Smeaton and towards the final year of my undergraduate. Uh, and Alan has been a huge mentor in my uh, and certainly the early to mid parts of my career. Uh, he um, helped me win a, an Irish uh, research scholarship then to do for, for my PhD funding. And uh, and also uh, it was quite a big move for me then because I had to finally leave home at the age of 21 then to move down to Dublin. So I had to leave my mother's home cooking, which was uh, quite an agonising thing uh, for me to do. Um, uh, but then Alan was uh, looked after me exceptionally well and uh, guided and mentored me. And uh, as part of that, helped open up a whole pile of new networks. So I think it's a really important thing to do is to try and uh, interact with others outside your own direct area. 
So, for example, and I had a four month placement uh, with Microsoft in their research headquarters uh, over in Seattle in the US, um, which was lots of fun. Um, what did I do during my PhD? Well, um, I was obsessed with a uh, this uh, concept of wearable cameras. Uh, you can see here essentially a device around uh, that one wears around via lanyard and it takes these first person point of view images. Uh, one of the um, uh, utopian thoughts about what these devices might do is uh, would be as a memory retrieval tool for people with um, autobiographical memory problems. Um, so there were some nice case studies um, around that. Um, but personally, myself and Alan, we were just fascinated around the challenges of dealing with vast volumes of data, um, and trying to store it, uh, analyze it appropriately and make sense of it. Um, and the work we did, uh, of course, I'm quite biased and I think was quite innovative for its time. Uh, and the the story of how I got to Oxford has got a little bit to thank uh, this chap here who's called James May. Um, so he was one of the Top Gear presenters um, uh, for or back when Top Gear had was it Jeremy Clarkson, James May and, um, uh, and the Hammond chap as well. So the um, uh, so James May then run a program in the BBC uh, about 15 years ago called James May's Big Ideas. Um, so he's looking at technologies of the future that may or may not be uh, of interest to the wider public. Um, so within this uh, program, then he uh, reached out to Alan and I and did a little um, a piece then on the uh, the, the uh, what we call life logging of the visual uh, uh, camera images and how we would computers would need to store and retrieve those memories. Um, so he ran that uh, and it was uh, quite, uh, um, of course, I'd be biased and said quite a nice little piece they did um, uh, or, or as part of that program. And uh, Charlie Foster then, who was at Oxford here, uh, saw that program and thought, well, this actually could be a really good way of trying to better uh, measure uh, nutrition and physical activity behaviours. Uh, so Charlie then had reached out to us um, at, because up to that point, uh, I, I'd never thought about um, uh, first of all, epidemiology, I, I, I'd never heard of it, I have to admit, uh, on to that point. Um, uh, I, I definitely couldn't pronounce it back then. And uh, uh, so uh, so I've got a lot uh, to thank uh, to Charlie Foster then, uh, who many of us here in this room uh, would know who was in the department until about five or six years ago. Um, so I was lucky then to get a Marie Curie Fellowship from the European Union uh, to, to move to Oxford. And the plan was to move there for two years um, and go back to Ireland uh, for a third year. And uh, I was part then of uh, Mike Rayner's, what was then called uh, British Heart Foundation Health Promotion Research Group. Um, and for anybody who was here long enough, I don't know if they recognise this building now. So it was the Richards building that used to be on the Old Road campus site. Uh, so that's where I, I started my life. Um, and, and was knocked down, I think, not too long after I joined. Um, but I think that was a, a correlation, not causation. And then the, um, but this was, I think, really uh, probably the seminal move in my life, I would say, in, or in terms of life and a career. Uh, because for the first time, I'd always had an interest around health and healthcare. Uh, but when I found out more about uh, epidemiology and the study designs around that, there was just a light bulb moment for me then in seeing, aha, this is how computing and medicine could perhaps be most productively combined together, or at least with my own uh, set of skills. Um, so it was really quite eye opening for me. And I almost kind of view it as a, as a retraining or a new training of an entirely new set of skills after the first few years when I came here to Oxford. Um, and for example, particularly the Richard Dahl seminar series, I found very inspiring and, uh, and I learned lots. Um, and probably the most uh, important meeting in my life uh, happened with the Richard Dahl seminar series. Um, I'm sorry, Rory, it wasn't your talk on uh, this one here, but it actually was. Uh... <laughs> Uh, it was actually this one by uh, John Wally um, uh, in, in Leeds. Um, what was the talk about? I can't remember because, uh, but what I do very clearly remember from this was, uh, it was uh, where I met my future wife, uh, Kate, then at the Richard Dahl seminar series. So so Richard Dahl's uh, greatest contribution to my life uh, was uh, um, uh, helping me meet my wife, uh, Kate. Um, so uh, I, I, yeah, I probably didn't concentrate as well in the content of that lecture as I should have in other ones, but uh, but then I, I bumped into Kate thereafter. Um, and uh, so that was uh, probably the, the best meeting I've ever had uh, in my life. Um, so uh, Kate then 
uh, persuaded me to open my eyes even more to travel. Uh, and certainly I went far beyond my comfort zone uh, in going to places uh, such as Ecuador here. Um, so we had uh, lots of fun going through the Amazon jungle and not too long um, after uh, we met. And the uh, about 15 months after we first met, so it was all quite fast. And I plucked up the courage then to uh, ask Kate to come back to Lag Beach that I showed you earlier on. Um, and I knew Kate enjoyed horse riding, so then we uh, organised some horse riding for her. And uh, I, I took the chance then in uh, going down on the on the knee then to uh, propose to her. And uh, lucky enough, she said yes then too. So um, uh, uh, so so that was uh, obviously very special for both of us. Um, and then uh, we move on to 2013. It was a year to remember in, in so many uh, ways. Um, first of all, it was when the department uh, was officially formed. And from my career point of view, that, that was uh, 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 really quite huge um, because I felt that I finally had a home uh, in Oxford uh, and I could see a clear career pathway then at the intersection of Kind of the amazing cohorts that that are within our department in the Nuffield Department of Population Health, um, and also opportunities then for people with computing science backgrounds such as myself then to make meaningful and uh, and proactive um, contributions then to departments such as that, and also towards the end of 2013, I, I had was probably the most me uh, uh, important meeting in terms of my career then uh, was with Martin Landry, uh, so. Uh, Martin has been a, an amazing mentor for my career. Uh, so I said first met him at the end of 2013. Um, and as Martin often jokes back then, he was the director of what was a hole in the ground. So the Big Data Institute was not built at that point. Um, uh, but it was really exciting to hear the vision for the Big Data Institute. Um, and he more or less said to me, you're in the right place. Um, just stay here. Wait till we get the building built. Um, and he was uh, very much uh, good in his word on that. And uh, uh, it, it, yeah, it was uh, a huge moment for me because I could again then see uh, a clear uh, um, a space that I could carve out as my own uh, and develop a program of research. So that was uh, incredibly important. And a lot of the research around then was around the UK biobank data set that I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and particularly the wrist worn uh, accelerometer data was collected as part of that was uh, a, a really seminal to my, my, my own work, my group's work. Um, and the data collection for that also started in 2013. Uh, and then finally, on the personal point of view, uh, Kate and I got married in 2013 as well. So uh, for our honeymoon, then we went to uh, Nepal and went uh, trekking around the Annapurna circuit region. Uh, so we had lots of fun uh, and it was probably, we looked quite tired there. It was probably, uh, we were quite tired there because I think we were up at five and a half thousand meters uh, at that stage. So, um, so we're both feeling uh, really quite tired, but proud of ourselves too, that we got up to around uh, five and a half thousand meters and the, the scenery is absolutely uh, stunning there as well. And the biobank data collection was happening all that time uh, um, while we were, um, I said, dropping down the Annapurna circuit and walking around and, and for a year or two afterwards. So the data collection stopped in around 2015 or thereabouts, which was also a, a huge a personal uh, milestone uh, for Kate and I then, where we had uh, the birth of our uh, two twin boys um, who are sitting here in the middle of the audience. Uh, so we had uh, Finn and Otto. Um, and I, I'm not sure which is which uh, in this particular <laughs> picture here. So, um, so Kate and I, we do try and keep notes uh, throughout because it is uh, quite uh, difficult uh, sometimes to look back in old photos and tell uh, the difference in them. Um, and here's a photo of us then uh, again near uh, the Lag Beach in, in Donegal um, uh, with the boys then a few months later. So, uh, so 2015 was a huge year where the UK Biobank data collection stopped uh, and also uh, Finn and Otto uh, came into being. And, was genuinely quite difficult then because Kate and I were completely uh, sleep deprived uh, all, all that time and trying to do work and research then is certainly not easy. Um, uh, so then I was very lucky to get uh, a fellowship around that time then from the British Heart Foundation Centre for Research Excellence um, and that provided some of the breathing space again to pursue my own independent programme uh, of research uh, which was really, um, uh, uh, really, really important for my own career development. Um, uh, but it might seem like it's a linear journey whereby you get a fellowship, do a few years of good work, get another fellowship, etc. 
but with fellowships, uh, there are many more, uh, or at least for at least for me, uh, failed applications and successful applications. Um, so all highlighted in red there were uh, applications that I applied for and, and did not succeed in. Uh, and one I think that was um, particularly disappointing, and I guess we remember the more recent failures better than uh, was in 2020 then. So I applied for a Wellcome Trust uh, Senior Research Fellowship, got amazing grant reviews um, uh, uh, from the peer reviewed section. Uh, but then my, uh, uh, yeah, I was really felt floored then when I wasn't awarded uh, that fellowship despite getting amazing reviews. Um, uh, but lucky enough, um, uh, again, by getting feedback from lots of the great mentors that are around Oxford, uh, they, they know who they are. Um, uh, I then uh, was lucky enough then to, by the skin of my teeth, then get uh, the uh, Welcome Trust Senior Research Fellowship the following year, just months before the scheme closed. Um, so uh, it, that was uh, probably the highlight of my um, scientific career was finding out that little bit of news. Um, and to make it even better, um, and so I received the news in August uh, on a campsite in France. So here we are, a picture taken by Kate to the boys that was in this particular campsite in Burgundy because um, uh, we recently got a camper van not too, uh, uh, not too long before that. Um, so we've had many happy camper van trips um, uh, in France. So it was, it was always going to be a good holidays anyway, but then it was particularly special and to receive the word that I'd uh, uh, received this uh, a very substantial fellowship. Um, and uh, there must be something good about August holidays uh, and getting away from work, because um, in the following August, we were in Lake Annecy um, down here in the Alpine region of, of France. Uh, and that's when I found out that I was awarded uh, my professorship as well. So um, so I think I'll just keep going on holidays in August um, to, <laughs> and away in the camper van. Uh, but the more serious point of view, I think it's very important there's some uh, balance between work and life as well. So with the um, uh, so an academic career is really good, particularly having young children uh, where, uh, whereby we can go on holidays. There's quite a degree of flexibility around that. Uh, and also, I think it's very helpful getting away on holidays um, because it helps flush out the mind and kind of reset myself. And I feel I come back then a lot more creative as well. Uh, at least that's my uh, personal uh, feeling. And I think it's quite a nice time to be creative because I'd just like to share with you some of the uh, the scientific opportunities uh, that I think exist at this uh, very exciting time then for wearables um, and artificial intelligence or machine learning, call it what you will. Um, and there's a really important opportunity then to uh, to embrace these, um, which I think can really make a step change difference in how we conduct epidemiological studies in future. And I've grouped it into uh, five main themes of interest. Um, the first is around uh, new measurements. Um, so can we move beyond physical activity and measure some other traits uh, in an objective uh, sense? Um, how do the patterns or the associations look in different populations? We need new populations. How can these types of technologies be integrated uh, into a, a range of new study designs, um, such as trials, um, uh, and, and also what new methods will we need to support this? Uh, and finally, what might the collaborations of, future, of the future look like um, uh, for research uh, at this intersection of, kind of wearables, machine learning uh, and large scale epidemiological studies? So some of the underpinning uh, technologies, I believe, to the new measurements part uh, is uh, around machine learning. And there's a particular uh, part of machine learning that I'm, I think, uh, really quite excited by. So it's this concept called self-supervised feature learning. It doesn't exactly roll off the tip of the tongue, but the, the concept of this is if I've got some the data for my wearable device, um, I might get a 10 second segment in time and I've got to try and get some features from that raw data. Traditionally, I might get something like a mean or a median or standard deviation or some Fourier features from that, but they're still handcrafted and guesses at best. So Xing Chan and our group and Hang Yuan then uh, have uh, really pioneered this concept then around self-supervised feature learning. So the idea is if I get a 10 second segment of a UK biobank's participant data, um, I can keep it in its normal uh, time um, uh, uh, order, or, or I can reverse it, or I can permute it, or I can time warp it. Um, and that creates a new set of tasks um, for a machine learning tool and to see, is the signal in its normal form or one of these permuted or time warped type forms? 
so then by we from Using the biobank study, we can get six billion uh, labeled training samples and from this, and we force our neural networks to essentially learn some features that are fundamental to human motion dynamics. Uh, and this is, uh, gives us a really good head start then across a range of uh, other tasks, whether it be for activity or sleep or circadian rhythms, etc. So this is a really exciting, I think, fundamental breakthrough uh, in terms of feature learning. And there are lots of ways we believe we can improve this in future by taking into account different data modalities, uh, data from different populations. Um, so this is a very, very exciting area. Um, and an example of this then is uh, Scott Small, then, who's in, this, uh, in the audience, then has used these self-supervised techniques to identify when people are walking uh, or not walking um, for every five or 10 seconds, and then from that kind count how many steps are happen happening within those walking episodes. Um, and then from this, we can see in the UK Biobank, then it's got a beautiful dose response association with accelerometer measured steps um, with all cause uh, mortality outcomes. But the data from these wearable devices aren't just useful for physical activity purposes. A completely different area is sleep. Um, so all the biobank participants were wearing these devices at, at night time as well. Uh, and then Hang Yuan, who's pictured here, ha has done some a brilliant follow up work from self supervised learning uh, to develop these uh, a method then called recurrent neural networks, essentially to take into account the time series nature of uh, the data from these devices. Um, to try and tell, first of all, whether subtle movements in the wrist are associated with a person being sedentary versus asleep, uh, which is quite difficult. And then secondly, uh, whether a person might be in REM or non-REM sleep. Um, so we validated this against polysonography, which is the gold standard measurement for uh, sleep behaviour. Um, and, uh, and then as you can see here, Hang has applied, to, uh, applied this to the UK biobanks. We've got device measured sleep here in the bottom. Uh, essentially, then your your hazard ratio, or think of it as a, like a risk for uh, all cause mortality, then after seven years um, on the y axis. And traditionally, what we would expect is a big U shaped association whereby it's bad to sleep very short, but also sleep very long. Uh, but with the device, we're not quite seeing this uh, big uplift uh, for those who have got the longer sleep duration. This is, of course, very preliminary data, um, but it, again, just like activity there, it might help us reconsider. Uh, our past and uh, understanding of how a behaviour, in this case sleep, uh, is associated with major disease outcomes. Um, so I think there's very exciting future work to be done to see does this correspond or not to our prior understanding when we've uh, asked people via self-reported information. Uh, but of course, sleep is quite difficult to measure from just movements on the wrist alone. We'd love some physiological uh, measurements uh, as well. Uh, and I think a really exciting study around this is the one that's led by uh, Barbara Cassidy, then who's sitting beside Finn there now, who's quietly reading his Kindle, which is good to see. Um, so Barbara then is uh, leading this study in the UK Biobank, the cardiac monitoring study. Um, and what's particularly exciting about these devices as part of this study, so they're chest worn uh, patches. Uh, they've got an accelerometer that measures movement uh, within them. Uh, and it looks very, uh, as you can see, the movement pattern uh, looks very similar to what we see with a wrist worn device that was uh, given to people a long time uh, beforehand. Uh, but also what's really exciting about this device is the cardiac monitoring activity or the physiological measurement uh, on these individuals. Um, because then by combining the physiological with the movement, it provides wonderful opportunities then to uh, uh, really assess sleep uh, and sleep stages uh, with much more precision than we've been able to do up to now. Uh, and also with the cardiac monitoring uh, signal, uh, it opens up uh, the opportunity to uh, consider other uh, phenotypes of interest. Uh, and one of those then is to consider some of the consequences um, of uh, uh, this phenomenon called premature ventricular contractions, or think of them as skipped heartbeats. Um, so Stefan, who's here somewhere sitting there over in the, on, on the uh, uh, over to your left, um, uh, so is, is very much leading this work. And Stefan has looked at the uh, Stefan van Jaubenboden um, has looked at the um, the exercise test date in the UK biobank. So there's always been a thought: are these uh, premature ventricular contractions benign or something to worry about. Um, and there's data to suggest that there may well be a dose response association between having more of these premature ventricular contractions um, and subsequent uh, major adverse cardiovascular uh, disease outcomes. 
but this is, of course, data from just a seven minute exercise test um, uh, that was uh, conducted in individuals. Uh, what is really exciting about the cardiac monitoring studies, we got a 14 day measurement um, period. So there's much more opportunities then uh, to assess uh, and, and get much more reliable assessments of the premature ventricular heartbeats um, or contractions um, uh, within uh, uh, over a 14 day period in, uh, in a substantial amount of people. So again, this opens up exciting new avenues of exploration. So lots of new measurements are coming uh, on board uh, via uh, the existing data sets we have or by new data sets that have got multiple modes of measurement. Uh, but of course, then what's really important, this is kind of epidemiology 101 then, is that we want to see uh, what these associations are like across different populations. Um, and also we want to integrate um, uh, these devices or measurement modalities uh, into a range of different study designs. So uh, first of all, uh, the China Kaduri Biobank, where Hai Dung Du, uh, Derek Bennett, uh, Zing Ming Cheng and many others uh, have done a phenomenal work uh, to measure data in 20,000 participants uh, over a pandemic uh, in China. Um, uh, and we're seeing that the, uh, the compliance to wearing these devices is the exact same no, as it was in the UK Biobank. And again, in these different populations, there'll be fascinating new questions that we can ask uh, with this data. One example is, uh, here's a sleep assessment and by hour of day. So in China, uh, there's a much more a phenomenon then of uh, individuals um, going for an afternoon nap. Um, so it's uh, much more prevalent than it is in the UK biobank population. So again, then we can ask questions around, for example, napping behavior and its association with um, uh, future disease outcomes uh, with much more precision than we previously could have done. Similarly, we think about circadian rhythms or circadian misalignment. Um, uh, where essentially we've got a, a 24 hour pattern, but some people, uh, the societal nine to five works them, and other people it doesn't work when they need a, a large lie on at the weekend, for example. Uh, in China, this is uh, uh, perhaps even more marked difference uh, because everyone's put in the same time zone, no matter how far east or west uh, you are. So what um, the consequence is that when you're trying to fight against um, the light dark cycles of, of nature? Uh, so there's f lots of fascinating questions that can be asked in this new population. Also, we've got uh, Laura Brocklebank then, who's uh, based at UCL working with Andrew Steptoe, but uh, comes uh, fairly regularly here to our department. And we've uh, assessed then in population representative samples, so the English study of longitudinal aging, and the Chinese counterpart, then the Chinese Health and Retirement Longitudinal Study, uh, we've collected data from another 15,000 uh, individuals. Again, this will open up, I think, lots of new opportunities uh, to uh, understand uh, variations in uh, activity and sleep, what are uh, the potential drivers of those and the potential consequences of those as well. And by integrating or, or by bringing together those different samples and particularly some genetic uh, and genomic data from those uh, samples, it opens up new opportunities uh, around target discovery analysis. Uh, so Laura um, uh, Portis, then, who's in our group, um, uh, she, she has, uh, uh, with the support of Nova Nordisk, then uh, been conducting a, a huge amount of genomic discovery analysis against all these new traits and measurements that we've been able to uh, uh, um, uh, derive or, or, or measure. Uh, so, uh, for example, then uh, we're finding a, a range of new genetic uh, signals that are driving sleep behaviours and physical activity traits as well. Uh, and working together with Novo Nordisk, uh, we're analysing these in the context of cardiometabolic traits to see if we can implicate uh, some new uh, genomic targets uh, of interest then uh, around the development of, of possible treatments for cardiometabolic disease. And with uh, Charlie Harper, uh, who many of you will know, uh, we're uh, very excited about the possibilities that there might be to integrate these uh, device-based assessments uh, as endpoints and trials. So traditionally in the past, um, uh, if I'm trying to discover what treatments uh, uh, might work or not work in an area such as heart failure and whether it can help people move more, uh, we've relied on questionnaires asking people what they do rather than directly measuring it. Uh, so there's a huge interest in using devices and to try and better assess uh, the impact um, of treatments on physical function outcomes. Um, and there are a number of uh, developments, a lot of trials are now running with these uh, digital device endpoints um, 
uh, and also across a range of uh, investigational products. So again, I think a very exciting uh, area by integrating uh, across different types of study designs, such as uh, within randomized control trials. So I just got a couple of last slides of science here now, and then the uh, also there's opportunities around new methods. Um, as Rory had mentioned earlier, a really key uh, driver for our own research group is uh, making sure whatever we do um, can be used by others, um, uh, ideally as many people as possible. I, I think Rory once said to me, I think maybe Richard Pito then said to you, I think you get 10 points if you do one study well, you get 100 if you inspire other people or help other people to do it well. So we're really driven by that uh, within our own group. Um, so we've got, uh, so Shing here uh, leads uh, a lot of uh, coding efforts in our team. So usually uh, we review each other's uh, computer coding um, uh, and we make all our code uh, available at the appropriate time then on GitHub so that other scientists can use and build on top of this. Um, and then any new measurements that we make around sleep, activity, circadian rhythms, uh, we put them back into the UK Biobank resource uh, so that the 30,000 registered users around the world can use uh, this, um, uh, these measurements that we make. And also we work with other uh, 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 external partners and to create some training uh, uh, videos and material and to help scientists around the world to use these uh, measurements that we create uh, in appropriate ways. So, uh, and a, a nice e example, I think, of bringing all this together then is the opportunity for new collaborations. Um, so the picture of uh, Elena Shreves, who is an NIH uh, Oxcam scholar. So it means she spends over the next four years, she'll spend half her time here at Oxford and half her time at the National Cancer Institute in the US. Um, <clears throat> and at Oxford then, uh, this has given us an opportunity uh, to work uh, together at, with the BDI and also the Cancer Epidemiology Unit uh, with Ruth Travis and uh, to think about uh, how we can uh, further understanding of how physical activity is associated uh, with uh, various cancer outcomes. Um, so I think this, uh, these types of data modalities offer lots of new opportunities for collaboration within the department, uh, bringing together uh, parts of, of the department that may not have collaborated so far. Uh, secondly, there are a huge amount of opportunities for collaboration uh, beyond NDPH, but within medical sciences in Oxford. Uh, an example of this is uh, a recent welcome discovery grant of a, um, uh, that's been awarded to Stuart Pearson then and the Sleep and Circadian Neuroscience Institute. Um, so we're interested in this area of the brain called the salience network and how circadian disruption uh, is associated with that within the context of mental health. Um, so the, the, the BDI or Big Data Institute is playing a very key um, uh, role uh, within this uh, large welcome discovery grant uh, and helping uh, further understanding around sleep and circadian disruption and its consequences uh, uh, around mental health disorders. Uh, and of course, then nationally and internationally, uh, our, our department is, uh, of course, very well placed then uh, to consider how we can lead the world even further than by a remote assessment and even larger scale in studies such as our UK Biobank uh, or our Future Health with David Hunter uh, and of course many other cohorts then across uh, the Richard Dahl Consortium in collaboration with Sarah Lewington who many people here in the audience will know. Uh, and there's really exciting opportunities to consider how smartphones and wearables uh, could be combined together uh, to help scientists of the future better measure uh, important uh, risk factors such as activity, sleep, circadian rhythms, uh, cognitive health that status as well. Um, and the partners or, or collaborators in the future might be very different uh, to those we've traditionally had in the past with people from the uh, tech industry um, being very uh, interested uh, and supportive uh, and engaged in trying to think how we can do uh, these assessments at scale. So traditionally, this will be my last slide in a talk such as this, um, uh, whereby I, I talk about how there's huge opportunities for uh, uh, to transform how we can conduct future epidemiological studies. Um, uh, and we've got a team of about 15 people. This is an old up to date or out of date slide um, or, or picture, uh, but we've got a team of about 15 people and we're all really keen to collaborate with others across the department, uh, across the university and beyond as well. Uh, so if you are interested or inspired by any of this, please, please, please do reach out to us. Um, uh, and of course, I've got to thank all our funders from the Wellcome Trust, uh, to Nova Nordisk, um, uh, to Swiss Re, a life insurance company, uh, to Health Data Research UK, the NHR Biomedical Research Centre, 
the at the British Heart Foundation, uh, who's been really strong supporter of my own career through the Centre for Research Excellence um, uh, and also the uh, EPSRC that uh, support a number of people within my group via the BDI's uh, Big Data Institute's training centre. Um, uh, but also, uh, I usually don't like uh, ending with lots of thanks, uh, but I want to thank all the people uh, within my group. Uh, first of all, uh, I learn much, much more from the people in my group than they learn from me. Uh, also, uh, there's a huge amount of colleagues uh, at the NDPH and Office Department of Population Health, BDI, Big Data Institute, uh, and Rubin College. Um, so uh, I know this is an out of date photo of the department. So we've, I think, now got almost 900 people in the department. Uh, and there's a huge amount of people that do on scene work uh, in the uh, HR teams, in the finance teams, um, uh, in the IT support teams. Um, the amount of help I get from people within the department is uh, phenomenal and it makes my uh, and much easier for me to concentrate on the science. Um, uh, and so I think that the line I've given is essentially I feel like I tap dance to work every day because I think it's very exciting science that we have um, and also um, uh, yeah, the, the amount of support we get uh, from around the department is, I think, quite uh, uh, and beyond as well, I think is quite incredible. So it makes it an absolute privilege uh, to uh, do research here. Um, I did want to highlight three work colleagues in particular who have, uh, I think, been really uh, key mentors for me over the last um, uh, uh, four or five years in particular. So we've got Cecilia Ingren uh, on the left uh, here, who's the director of the Big Data Institute. Cecilia has been a, a fabulous mentor for my career development uh, over the over the last uh, number of years, um, providing particularly advice around fellowship applications, uh, strategy, um, etc. Uh, also, then we've got uh, Rory uh, pictured here. So, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to take Rory and Martin together then, because both have been uh, incredibly supportive um, of my career development. Um, uh, because I, I had a, I showed a number of failed fellowship applications, and the message Rory and Martin always give me was keep doing what you're doing, and that was just such an amazing message of support to get at a time uh, kind of earlier in mid in the career. So that really helped me think longer term and be more ambitious in my thoughts. So a huge thank you, Rory, uh, to you and and also Martin for all your support. Um, uh, but of course, um, the biggest bit of support I'd like to say uh, thanks to then is my family. Um, because uh, when I go home at the end of the day, it's uh, they who've got to uh, put up with me. And in many ways, I think they probably don't care what I do as long as I'm somewhat happy and all. And uh, and I so I hope I've reassured you, I do tap dance to work. Uh, so I am uh, very happy. I first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Kate, uh, Kate's parents, uh, Robin and Liz, uh, who I know are tuning in online. Uh, so uh, I know not everyone's happy with their in-laws, but I've uh, struck luck there again. Uh, so uh, with that, so a huge thank you, Robin and Liz, if you are uh, tuned in online. Uh, also, uh, a huge thank you to uh, my sisters. This, I think I showed a picture to start Maria was sitting down the seat as a two or three year old. So this was her wedding day then just a couple of years ago. Um, so Marie and her husband PJ, and also my other sister Denise here. She's got her children Kaylee and Callum, uh, and her husband Stuart. Um, so huge thank you to them, uh, but a particularly a huge thank you to my parents uh, Dennis and Teresa, who are here in the middle of the audience. Um, uh, so they've been always uh, my number one supporters, um, uh, and they're even here with me then today. So it's, so I hugely uh, appreciate that. So thank you very much, mom and dad. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to finish uh, with this uh, nice photo here uh, near uh, sort of Rydal Water or Grasmere Lake, one of the two. I keep getting them mixed up in the, in the Lake District. Um, so we've got uh, a picture then of Finn uh, and Otto. Uh, and most of all, I'd say a huge thank you to my wife, Kate. Um, so Kate and I uh, are obviously in, in the department uh, here together. Um, I, I've been uh, incredibly lucky, I think, because uh, Kate is uh, at least my equal, if not better. Um, and I've been very lucky to get some uh, incredible breaks in the department. Uh, Kate's uh, already had an NHR fellowship, and I know she will get uh, more fellowships in the future because I hugely value her uh, feedback and support that she gives to me. And she's uh, always there for me. So a huge thank you to you, Kate. And finally, a thank you for everyone for taking time out of your day uh, to come along uh, to this. Um, uh, and I really do appreciate you being here uh, on this day and hope that you enjoy the drinks and nibbles that will be outside afterwards. Thank you very much.
not really any tradition to have uh, formal formal <laughs> questions or anything like that. So do you want informal questions over a, a drink? There was a debate earlier in the week as to whether alcohol should be allowed in the building. I think the the, the conclusion is still out, um, but uh, at the moment we're we're drinking alcohol okay. or non-alcoholic drinks as you prefer, and just a, a little. Um, so, thank you, Rory. Uh, something to remember right. this day. Oh, thank uh, you very much. And uh, again, congratulations, Aidan, for fantastic achievements in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rory. Thanks.